Well, welcome everyone to this evening's History Revealed program. I'm Peter Ratcliffe from the Eastside Freedom Library, uh, co-hosting tonight's event with Robin Priestley uh, from the Ramsey County Historical Society. Uh, this is a exciting series and an exciting evening. Um, we have been sharing, uh, can you hear me okay? Someone has chatted, he can't hear me. No. Um, so uh, we have been doing this work for almost three years now um, of curating at least one monthly event around the theme of history revealed. Uh, we're doing some new things this year. Um, the Ramsey County Libraries, particularly the Roseville Library, is a, also now a partner in this project. Uh, we've also picked a theme uh, for the year, and the, the theme is Making Minnesota Natives, Immigrants, and Migrants. Um, and there's so much good historical research and scholarship being done um, that once a, not, once a month is no longer enough for us. And, and so some months we will have two or even three uh, events. And Robin will tell you about the next event, which is next week. Um, one of the other things we're doing that's new is thanks to the generosity of the Phillips Bloomstein family on the east side of St. Paul, who have given us a generous donation in honor of their brother and brother-in-law, Danny Phillips, who was an activist attorney in Great Britain, representing the mine workers union there for many years, who passed away from COVID in 2020. In honor of Danny's memory, they've made a gift that enables us to buy books that are mentioned, are relevant to this series, and to give those books away, particularly to young readers. So um, if you want to get in touch with us about that, we're easy to find, info at eastsidefreedomlibrary.org. Um, I want to mention that last month we had two great programs one around the book, We Are Meant to Rise, uh, co-edited by Carolyn Holbrook and David Mura, and uh, an event by Bill with Bill Lindicky around his book, St. Paul and Urban Biography. We do have 10 copies of each of those books that we are eager to give away to young readers. And so please do reach out to us. If you were unable to attend those events, the videos of them are available on the YouTube pages of both the Eastside Freedom Library and the Ramsey County Historical Society. The Eastside Freedom Library's mission is to inspire solidarity, work for justice, and advocate for equity for all. I think we're gonna learn a lot about that tonight uh, from Jane Henderson. So let me just briefly introduce Jane, uh, she is, uh, she grew up here in the Twin Cities um, before heading west to California, earning a bachelor's degree in ethnic studies in Spanish at the University of San Diego. She is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Geography at UC Berkeley, which I have to say is one of the coolest departments in the country. Um, and she has returned to Minneapolis to undertake the research that will be embodied in her dissertation, part of which we will be seeing and hearing tonight. So I wanna turn things over to my partner, Robin Priestley uh, from the Ramsey County Historical Society to talk about their work and also introduce what they're up to. Robin, please. Thank you, Peter. Can everybody hear me too? Yes, good. Thank you, Jane. Um, first of all, thank you to Jane Henderson for being here tonight. And thank you to the Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library for all their support and partnership in this series of programs. We're going on for over five years, nearly six years now, which is which is wonderful. Um, 
I also want to thank our members and supporters that are here tonight. If you're not a member or supporter of the Ramsey County Historical Society or the Eastside Freedom Library, please consider supporting us. We rely on the support of members and friends like you to continue to present these programs and all of our other efforts. And there are some great benefits to joining the Ramsey County Historical Society. You get our wonderful quarterly magazine, Ramsey County History, and um, admission to our historic site, Gibbs Farm, and a lot of other benefits, which are all on our website, which is on the slide on your screen, www.rchs.com. Um, and please check out the uh, Eastside Freedom Library and the Roseville Library websites as well. They both groups have wonderful programs in addition to this History Revealed series. So as Peter mentioned, next week, we have a great program on Scotty Primus Davis, A Story Forgotten to Time with Mary Kay Boyd. Chester C. Owens Jr., Granville T. O'Neill, and Steve Trimble, who recently wrote an article about Scotty Primus Davis in the upcoming issue of Ramsey County History Magazine. Scotty Davis was a teacher who grew up in St. Paul, and she was the first African American woman to graduate from the University of Minnesota. Um, she became an English teacher. She got a master's degree from Harvard and she has educated some absolutely wonderful and influential people in her time. So that will be again next Thursday on Zoom. You can see our website or the Eastside Freedom Library for links to sign up. Um, and then we've got more programs coming up like Peter mentioned throughout the rest of the year. So those will again be on our website. And um, right now we're still going through Zoom, at least through the spring. And we'll, when we can go back, we'll figure out how to do that. So um, as a reminder tonight, please keep your microphones and personal cameras turned off during the formal presentation. And you can put your questions and comments in the chat and we'll read those out loud for Jane to answer later. The program is being recorded and it will be up on our Eastside Freedom Library and Ramsey County Historical Society YouTube channels in a couple days after the program. We would like to acknowledge the sacred Dakota land, Minnesota Makoche, the land where the waters are so clear they reflect the clouds, is the ancestral and contemporary homeland of the Dakota people. It is also home to the Anishinaabe and other indigenous peoples. The Ramsey County Historical Society acknowledges that its sites are located on and benefit from these sacred Dakota lands. Ramsey County Historical Society is committed to preserving our past, informing our present, and inspiring our future. Part of doing so is acknowledging the painful history and current challenges facing the Dakota people, just as we celebrate the contributions of Dakota and other Indigenous peoples. You can find our full land acknowledgement statement on our website. Again, it's rchs.com, which includes actionable ways in which Ramsey County Historical Society pledges to honor the Dakota and other Indigenous peoples of Minnesota, Mekoche. We are committed to presenting the stories and histories of all in our community. And I'm so pleased to bring you Jane Henderson tonight. I wanna to thank Peter for helping set this up. And um, again, want to talk a little bit about our Making Minnesota program, which will explore the, these untold stories, histories and experiences, some of the worldwide immigrant, African-American and indigenous communities that make up this, our most diverse county. So to that end, thank you, Jane. Wonderful. Um, thank you, Robin. Thanks, Peter, for organizing this and getting it all together. And um, I'll just get started. Uh, so today I'm going to be presenting on a piece of my dissertation research, um, which is largely archival, meaning that I look through historical documents. Um, of Minnesota's history and try to understand and theorize from those documents. Uh, so I will get my slides going. Great. I hope you all can see this. I can't see any of you. So <laughs> um, 
I'm going to take that as yes. Great. Um, well, as oh, I can't see the chat. Thank you. Great. <laughs> um, so today I'm going to be presenting on the piece of my dissertation research, which broadly examines a Black sense of place in relation to settler colonialism throughout the history of Minnesota. My presentation today, Settler Colonialism, seen through the life of Harriet Scott, focuses on the westward expansion of the United States and the customs and racial thinking that it brought throughout the 19th century. I ground this in the seldom told story of Harriet Scott. Uh, and actually, because I don't know everybody in the audience, I have a lot of friends and family. So thank you guys all for supporting. Um, I'm wondering if you could put in the chat um, where you're coming from so I can get like just a general sense of mostly how many Minnesotans are in the room um, and who might be familiar with some of the places that I'm talking about. Okay, so we have a lot of St. Paul, White Bear Lake, Minneapolis, Houston, Minneapolis, St. Paul, amazing. Phillips community in Minneapolis, Berkeley. Shout out to all my Berkeley friends. Portland. Okay, wow. Colorado. <laughs> um, Roseville. Oh my goodness. Okay, so everywhere, basically, um, which is great because I'm going to try and, and make this as like introductory as possible. So for those of you who are familiar with um, the places that I'm talking about, feel free to share your experiences about them in the chat or in our Q&A session later. Um, and for those who are unfamiliar, I'm just really glad you've came. You've come today to um, learn a little bit more about Minnesota history. So um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, Peter, you'll be fielding questions at the end, right? Or Bailey, someone will. Yes, okay. yeah, and tracking them on Facebook as well. Okay, yep. awesome, thank you. So uh, this will be the first time that I'm sharing this research with such a large audience. So I wanna thank each of you also for taking the time to come and discuss some of this hidden uh, parts of Minnesota's history with me. Um, in the background of this presentation is of course the most controversial, one of the most controversial and famous Supreme Court cases in US history, the 1857 Dred Scott versus Sanford decision. In his ma majority reflection, Justice Taney declared that African-Americans were not citizens and therefore did not have the right to sue for their freedom. I, like most people, I think today, came to Harriet's story through my interest in her husband, Dred, and his experience of slavery in the North, but I did not realize her impact in this story, that both Dred and Harriet had sued for their freedom after having lived in free soil, um, which at the time was called Wisconsin territory, but is present day Minnesota. Some historians have even speculated that it was Harriet whose impetus and drive to protect her children from being sold down river, uh, encouraged Dredd to bring the suit against their then owners, Irene Sanford and her brother, John. I was shocked that I had never learned about her life, her experience of the contradictions of being unfree in free territory or of her involvement in one of the most important Supreme Court cases in US history. Her proximity to some of the largest protagonists in the American story didn't end up lending her any notoriety and her presence in historical documents remains extremely limited. However, I think this is what makes her story so important to the way we understand the origins of black communities in Minnesota and the ways the lives of the enslaved illuminate the different intimacies and mundane, the more mundane aspects of US westward expansion. And um, something that I hope you'll pick up on today that I'm really trying to get across is, is the kind of everyday life experience of the enslaved through settler colonialism rather than focusing on large um, wars um, and things like that, uh, which also kind of 
shadow Minnesota's history. Um, to begin, I think it's all important that you know how I approach my research and this story. I'm not trained as a historian, but I value history and archival methods in my research. I am a geographer and I use the tools of the discipline of geography to understand the changes in place over time. So what does this mean? What is geography? It's not really a discipline that a lot of people are necessarily familiar with. They may have taken a course in middle school or high school. And by the time got, they got to college, if they attended college, had not um, had the experience of taking a geography class. So simply the term when broken down um, from the Greek roots, geo and graphy, um, means earth writing. So based on this definition alone, it seems that geographers could study and write about pretty much everything that happens on earth. And it does feel limitless in that sense um, most of the time. However, a central aspect of the field is that we consider our research questions spatially. We either do this through a more positivist approach and, and data collection, which is typical of physical geography, such as the forms of atmospheric, or environmental sciences, or from a humanist perspective that seeks to understand the layers of relationships that people have to the natural environment. Um, and this is more of the human geography side, which you can see here. As a human geographer, I follow an intellectual tradition whereby I look at a place and try to understand how it was produced. One of these intellectual predecessors is geographer and prison abolitionist, Ruth Wilson Gilmore. In an interview uh, she did recently, she describes geography not as a field solely where people make maps, though many of us still do, but rather she says that geographers think about and ask ourselves, why do things happen where they do? So as a geographer, I ask questions like, what forces both human and non-human created the place that I live in, that I grew up in? Why do some places bring up deep emotions and others do not? Who gets to belong to a place and who is marginalized or excluded? And at the heart of these are all spatial questions. They're geographic questions. So ultimately this is the approach that I take in my research um, that I'm interested in the process by which a place comes to be what it is um, in the present. And this is also why I value history so much in my own research. Which brings me to the topic of today's discussion, um, settler colonialism seen through the eyes of Harriet Scott. My argument comes from over a year of archival research as well as site visits. Um, and for this presentation specifically, uh, site visits to historic Fort Snelling, which is where Dredd and Harriet Scott lived while they were in um, Minnesota or the land that became Minnesota. The main point that I hope to get across to you today is, um, is that the domestic labor of the enslaved made settler colonialism possible. Harriet Scott's skilled work at the fort ensured not only the physical survival of white settlers, but her specific task, tasks established the necessary racial distinctions for settler colonialism to function and this main distinction that I've identified is a difference between people who were deemed, people and practices that were deemed civilized and those that were deemed uncivilized or savage, in quotes. This distinction justified the elimination of native title to homelands, ignored Dakota's sovereignty and life ways, and turned land into property to be bought and sold by settlers and their descendants. So the story, um, for Harriet in Minnesota really does begin at Fort Snelling, which um, was the first white settlement in what is now the state of Minnesota. It was erected um, between 1819 and 1820 on a cliffside at Bedote, which is the convergence point of two rivers, the Mississippi and Minnesota, um, which at the time was called by um, the French and French fur traders and 
um, Americans, um, St. Peter's River. It was and remains a sacred site to the Dakota people whose extensive knowledge of the rivers and bodies of water in Minnesota, as well as the flora and fauna and other uh, more than human life allowed them to live and thrive for centuries before the arrival of Europeans and US settlers. The fort remains a contested site and it's a place of layered histories of violence, which um, for the purpose of today, I don't get into too much, but I'm happy to talk more about um, Fort Snelling in the Q&A. But it's important uh, particularly to understand the history of settler colonialism in Minnesota. So next I'm gonna, oh, um, this is an image of, that I took of Fort Snelling behind the officer's quarters looking out over um, the convergence of the two rivers. Next, I'm gonna define this term that I've invoked quite a bit today, um, but haven't yet defined, which is um, settler colonialism. And it has a complicated set of usage um, across different disciplines and also in movement spaces and organizing. But I, I tend to understand it as a framework for understanding the indigenous experience of colonization in places where native knowledge, lifeways, and native people were replaced by settler institutions, settler sovereignty, and settlers themselves. One often cited thinker in settler colonial studies is Patrick Wolfe. He's an Australian scholar who argued in his article, um, which you can see at the bottom here, Settler Colonialism and the Elimination of the Native, that settler colonialism is a structure, not an event. Two key quotes from this article, um, I pasted up here because I think they illustrate what Patrick Wolf means when he says this. Um, that as its own form of co colonialism, settler states do not use indigenous labor or solely extract the natural resources from the land, such as mineral or oils, as you can see, and other um, historic instances of colonialism. Instead, the land itself becomes the resource, and it becomes a resource for a new class of non-Indigenous people to live and um, own. However, in order for this to happen, Indigenous peoples must be removed from their land to make way for a new set of institutions and a new structure, which is um, what Patrick Wolf here identifies as a structure. Um, under settler colonialism, quote, settler um, colonizers come to stay, meaning that the presence of a settler class seeks to become native. So essentially, um, we can see this now in, in the United States, which is a settler state, um, that rhetoric or discourse around who is an American is largely um, erasing any kind of indigenous experience of place um, or indigenous histories. And it's assumed that um, native people no longer exist or are alive and surviving um, into the present, but that they are perpetually um, in the past and that this, the settler state is, is the current kind of um, identity of, of what it means to be like an American citizen. Uh, and, and Essentially, settler colonialism destroys native life ways in order to replace them with settler institutions. Um, another framing of Patrick Wolf's work that argues set about settler colonialism as a structure is that of indigenous studies scholar um, Ka, Ka Nui, um, who breaks down what structure and event means here. And so I'll just read this direct quote. Understanding settler colonialism as a structure exposes the fact that colonialism cannot be relegated to the past, even though the past present should be historicized. The notion that colonialism is something that ends with the dissolving of the British colonies when the original 13 became the early US states has its counterpart narrative in the myth that indigenous peoples ended when colonialism did. Um, if any of this is confusing, I'm happy to come back to it and work through it together in, in the Q&A and discussion. So I hope you can just still follow along with me as I get more into some of the history. 
So how does this play out in the story of Minnesota? Well, historians of the Old Northwest Territories, which um, make up the uh, Midwest, the Great Lakes region, the upper Midwest, have determined that the primary distinction among people in this region um, and at this time period between the 1700s and the early 1900s um, was that of civilized versus uncivilized. And so people and practices and land use itself would be categorized in either one of those two slots. This division deemed indigenous ways of being such as free movement, um, indigenous styles of dress and reciprocal relation relationships to the environment as uncivilized, while sed sedentarism through agriculture, colonial styles of dress and cleanliness were considered civilized. So it's here in the context of these diverging claims to land between the settler and native figures that Harriet Robinson lived and labored. Um, Harriet Robinson, uh, later Scott, was enslaved at Fort Snelling in the Old Northwest Territory between 1835 and 1840. She was brought there by Lawrence Tolliver, an Indian agent appointed by Secretary of War John C. Calhoun, who, um, if you're from Minnesota, you'll know uh, is the namesake of what we now call Lake Bidamakoska, um, was named after, after John C. Calhoun originally when it was called Lake Calhoun. Um, and he was appointed in 1819 to negotiate treaties with the, the Dakota for the purchase and distribution of payments for their homelands. These are called annuity payments. Tolliver set up the St. Peter's Agency at Fort Snelling and used nearby buildings and land to broker these treaty negotiations. He regularly debated throughout his papers and notes, um, which I've read, over the best practices to engage the Dakota and the Ojibwe um, in terms of how to get them to practice agriculture, how to get them to um, give up their land and engage them in the fur trade. So he also debated and regularly had disagreements with founding figures in Minnesota's history, such as Henry Sibley and other employees of the American Fur Trade Company, which at the time was the most powerful business in the United States, um, which is about between 1830 and 1850. There were never more than a dozen enslaved people at Fort Snelling at a time in the early 19th century. Additionally, it seemed that these frontier geographies offered multiple freedoms that were unavailable to those enslaved in the plantation south. Speculations of the historic record seem to indicate that there's some sort of flexibility and a varying degree of freedom at Fort Snelling and elsewhere in the Northwest Territory. Legally, however, the region was free soil through two key um, legal doctrines, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 and the Missouri Compromise of 1820. As such, slavery was legally banned within these territorial boundaries. And the legal precedent for um, the banning of slavery would actually not be overturned until the fateful 1857 Dred Scott v. Sanford decision in which both pieces of legislation were deemed unconstitutional. A year later, slavery was legally banned within the boundaries of Minnesota by the ratification of the state constitution in 1858. So um, Minnesota joined uh, the United States as a free state. Thus, the archive of slavery in Minnesota or the series of historic documents, um, despite containing one of the most exciting stories and histories and of um, a Supreme Court case that ultimately uh, or historians say led to the US Civil War. Um, the archive in Minnesota is limited at best and otherwise almost non-existent. Most of the information about Harriet's life comes from a few key primary sources um, and primary sources are documents from the time that um, she was alive. Harriet was unable to read or write. So most of what is known about her comes from these surrounding sources such as um, Tolliver's papers and journals. Um, 
for anybody who's interested in a secondary source, which is um, the work of historians who also interpret um, the primary source material, I highly recommend um, this book, which is called Mrs. Dred Scott by Leah Vandervelde. Um, she does an extensive history of Harriet's life. Um, and I believe is probably one of the only books that I've seen to do it um, so detailed. Um, so um, here we can see one of these documents in the Lawrence Tolliver collection. Um, and if in the chat, some people would like to tell me like what do you maybe see if you can if you can see this doc this document? Is there anything that stands out to you? Um, are, are there any words that you can make out? Names, first names, and you can read the names on the right side. Yeah. And yep, the Franklin Society on the left side. Okay, great. So I think we all are kind of maybe seeing similar things here. Um, this is one of the only primary documents that attests to Harriet's life in Fort Snelling, which um, is interestingly enough scribbled almost haphazardly on the back of a different invitation um, that Lawrence Tolliver received to join, to become a, a member of the Franklin Society. On, on the back of this sheet of paper, he lists um, 21 of his slaves. And it's unclear if he had them all at the same time, but likely he had about five or six in, um, enslaved people, owned five or six enslaved people uh, at a time and has listed them sort of hidden on the backside of this paper, which in comparison to the archive of slavery in the plantation South, where um, slavery was widely practiced and um, accepted, nor was it illegal, um, you'll have like lots and lots of records, but here in the, in the North, um, there's a silencing of the work and the lives of the enslaved. And if you can see, I tried to zoom in, which I'll do next, but um, this is a zo zoomed in of the second image where you can see Harriet's name listed um, about second from the bottom. Um, and this is one of the only documents that she is, um, only documents in the archive where she appears. So what these archival silences and absences might seem is that it might indicate to historians that slavery played an insignificant role in westward expansion and the development of the frontier, its incorporation of the, the westward, westward land into the United States. Rather, I see the silences at work to working to occlude the labor necessary for maintaining the civilized customs of US imperial agents and that obscure illegal slaveholding in the, in the old Northwest territory. The absence of slavery in the archive does the work to uphold settler clam claims to landed property by hiding the necessary forms of work needed to create those distinctions in the first place. So I'll again return to my argument, which is that slavery on the frontier, whether practiced by officials in the military or the slaveholding um, for domestic purposes, practiced by Tolliver at the St. Peter's Indian Agency, this slave, slavery made settler life possible. And it did so in two ways. The first is the use of profits from slaveholding in the plantation region, which is the South, 
that enabled wealthy owners to invest in real estate speculation prior to the incorporation of the Minnesota Territory as a state of Minnesota in 1858. It also fostered the first forms of capital investment in the territory after statehood through infrastructure and development projects. And for more information on that, I highly recommend um, this book, Slavery's Reach by Christopher Lehman, um, which goes into the economics, the financial um, and, and profits of slave owners in the South and their impact in development of the state of Minnesota. And I think the East Side, especially um, where the East Side Freedom Library is, uh, Peter can probably share some, uh, some information about that specifically. Uh, <clears throat> this movement of capital from the plantation South to the Northwestern frontier throughout the 19th century, while it was key to infrastructure and property relations, is a bit outside of what I'm gonna do for the rest of the talk. What I wanna focus on is what I've identified as the second way that slavery made settler life possible, which was through the domestic, mundane, and intimate labor of the enslaved, such as Harriet and her husband, Dred Scott. Harriet's primary responsibilities on the frontier, cooking, tending to the fire, and cleaning laundry, ensured the collective survival of the Tolliver family and others at Fort Snelling Post. Harriet performed this intimate labor of reproducing the Tolliver household under extremely harsh conditions, especially in the winter months. Um, and here you can see an image of um, Fort Snelling from, from the archive. Uh, and this can kind of give you a picture of what the land looked like at that moment, even though this is um, not dated. Um, as I said before, she first arrived at the St. Peter's Indian Agency at the, at the fort in the spring of 1835. Tolliver was appointed to the post and moved from Pennsylvania, which is also a free soil state, but he still had slaves there, um, as it was a well-practiced custom to bring slaves to the frontier. Military officials with frontier posts were even given cash allowances for personal servants, most of whom were enslaved. The primary purpose of the slave was to make the master's living circumstances more habitable. As such, Harriet was tasked with meeting Tolliver's immediate survival needs. Some of these needs were collective, such as maintaining a fire for warmth throughout the agency house in sub-freezing weather and cooking meticulously rationed meals to stretch the limited food supply between steamboat shipments up the Mississippi. Other tasks, namely washing clothing, were essential to maintaining the racial distinctions of settler colonialism. Racial formation on the frontier, as I kind of mentioned before, heavily relied on cultural markers of difference between white settlers and the quote unquote savage Indian. Clothing ended up being the primary mode of making this, dis this distinction visible. Maintaining a well-cleaned appearance along with regular grooming proved that one was civilized. And this distinction between civilized and uncivilized on the frontier enabled agents of the United States to make clams to, claims to land as rightful owners of property by removing indigenous land title because um, they were not properly uh, civilized and therefore not properly using the land. However, the reason US officials were even able to wear clean clothing, a fundamental element of civilized society was a function of slave labor at Fort Snelling. Um, Harriet worked as a laundress throughout her life, even during her time away from uh, the frontier post at Fort Snelling. The work of laundering clothes was one of the only ways for emancipated Black women in the North, as well as the South, to earn a wage. In the grow growing urban center of St. Louis, Missouri, where Harriet ended up living the majority of her life and lived the, and um, where she brought the suit for freedom, laundry had been an essential form of work. It crossed the lines between the intimate and the industrial such that Black washerwomen in Atlanta in the late 1800s joined labor movements and led successful strikes for better working conditions post-emancipation. Despite the limited attention their organizing has received by historians, 
Their labor is so central in African-American history across the North, as well as the plantation South, that Dr. Carter G. Woodson, the founder of Negro History Week, um, which we now recognize as Black History Month for the entire month of February, called the Black washerwoman, well, excuse me, called the Black washerwoman, quote, a vanishing figure whose name everyone should mention with veneration. In his 1930 article about the economic and emotional impact washerwomen had in African-American history, Dr. Woodson asks, and why should the Negro washerwoman be thus considered? Because she gave her life as a sacrifice for others. Whether as a slave or a free woman of color of the antebellum period, or as a worker in the ranks of an emancipated people, her life without exception was one of unrelenting toil for those whom she loved. In the history of no people has her example been paralleled. In no other figure in the Negro group can be found a type measuring up to the level of this philanthropic spirit in unselfish service. Part of the reason that um, Carter G. Woodson venerates the washerwoman so much is because of their essential role in um, producing uh, not only um, a form of care, like intimate care uh, in cleaning their family's clothes, as well as that of um, mostly uh, white masters or wealthy white uh, patrons who would send their clothes to be laundered. Uh, they also um, are extremely important because this work was very, very difficult. Laundry, cleaning laundry at the time was extremely labor intensive. At Fort Snelling at the Indi and the Indian Agency House, the water needed to be collected from the river and brought to a rolling boil over the fire. Once the linens and garments were inserted into the pot, the only way to clean the fabric was through vigorous stirring and scrubbing on washboards in the searing lye-soaked water. Harriet likely would have made her own soap through a chemically toxic process of combining the ashes from fire and fat stores, um, which she may have gotten from um, excess on steamboats or um, some, some stores that they had left over at the fort. After the clothes were properly washed, laundresses would need to lift the sopping heavy garments to hang them dry on a clothesline. During the winter months at Fort Snelling, many household chores could not be completed due to these freezing temperatures. And for those of you in Minnesota right now, I know you're experiencing these freezing temperatures. Um, in the winter then, the primary task for Harriet was to tend to multiple fireplaces at the house. As fireplaces were the sole source of heat in buildings with little insulation, they needed to be tended to 24 hours a day seven days a week, often for six months um, of the year. During the winters, Harriet and another of Tolliver's slaves, Eliza, who was the first name on that list that I showed you earlier, would have likely rotated watches to ensure that the coals never went out. While Carter G. Woodson's article reflected on Black women providing financially for their families, what we can see in the work that Harriet did for the Tolliver household whose laundry she cleaned, whose home she kept warm, whose food she grew and cooked, made the frontier more livable for agents of the United States in this territory. The work of making settler modes of living possible was also necessary to establish the distinction between civilized and uncivilized. Elite frontiersmen prided themselves on maintaining a sense of civility and proper customs in a geography that they deemed wild and savage. They believed that through virtuous hard work, namely developing agri excuse me, agriculture, that they were superior and better qualified to use the land. However, what Harriet's life and work in the Minnesota Territory shows is that men stationed around Fort Snelling actually required unpaid enslaved labor to even live at the standards that they deemed civilized, proper, and fit. Her life illuminates that the antagonisms of settler colonialism, those between on the one hand, the white civil settler, and on the other, the savage native, all in quotes, built 
were built through mundane everyday chores of enslaved black men and women at the fort. Um, and so by way of conclusion, I hope I was kind of able to share some of the conditions, lived experience and the landscape changes that were necessary to establish and maintain the state of Minnesota. Learning this history of place and the role of slavery in it helps us not take Minnesota for granted. And what I mean by this is that it helps us not assume that the status of statehood or any of the infrastructure, the boundaries that we know to be um, lining the state were destined to happen or that it was an inevitable process or that the state has always been a benevolent place, uh, especially for our black people. Instead, my research looks to uncover and understand the processes, actions, and decisions that made the state what it is today. And what I think Harriet Scott's story illuminates is that these actions can be the mundane everyday chores, as well as the landmark cases that shape our lived environment and our relationship in the places we live. And I hope you learned a little bit about Harriet today using my geographic approach. <laughs> um, and, but in addition to that, I. I truly believe that learning history in this way helps us see the small choices and negotiations by both people with power and those without um, that produce kind of what we see as history in the present. And this I think shows us that we're all historical and spatial actors, whether we consider ourselves to be or not. Thinking, thinking through how a place is made shows us that it can be made differently. And for those of us who have experienced life in Minnesota, we know now that we urgently need alternative visions for the state in the present and future. And with that, I would just like to finish and say, thank you all for coming. And I'll open it up to questions and feedback. Um, and just really excited to hear your thoughts. Thanks. If you'd like to type your questions in the chat, Peter and I will read those for Jane. Likewise, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, feel free to type your questions uh, into the comment function on Facebook. And Clarence put in um, a couple links if you missed those. Uh, Chris Lehman had come uh, done some programs for us. And also uh, thank you, Clarence, for a link to those. Lots of great compliments. Anybody have questions? So if I may, Jane, this is Peter. Um, I want to, though you've focused on the micro, I want to ask a really big question that your presentation suggests to me. You don't exactly say it, but it seems to me with your emphasis on the civilized in quotes versus the uncivilized in quotes, that you're, you're arguing that black labor produced whiteness. And I wonder if, if you'd like to play with that a little bit. Yes, I certainly can, Peter. That was a great question. And um, to make sure that I heard it correctly, you're just kind of wanting me to expand a bit on this idea that black labor creates whiteness. Mm -hmm. I would say that's probably pretty close to where I'm getting with, <laughs> uh -huh. with this, um, but that's all based on what I've read and seen in the archive, like in Minnesota's history. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't intend to have that argument necessarily. It's more of a reflection on, on how I'm reading the historic 
documents that I'm coming across. Um, especially because I think in our discussions around Minnesota and whiteness in Minnesota, uh, it there is a kind of like taken for grantedness um, that Minnesota just is white and has always been white and um, the kind of implication that it will be white forevermore. And I take this approach to history, even though it is like you said, very micro level um, to try to understand if that is the case, understand how it came to be that way. Um, and to me, it really is just also about identifying a lot of the contradictions in, in Minnesota's history, which is, I think, what slavery in the state really, really illuminates. Mm -hmm. um, but beyond the main contradiction of like freedom, like uh, being unfree and free territory, but this other contradiction that like white settlers use land better because they know how to turn it into property and sell it and make money off of it. Unlike um, the Dakota at the time who had totally different relationships to the land and continue to have different relationships to the land than the ones that we do. And, um, but this big contradiction that like the only way that they were actually able to identify this distinction was because they had other people doing the work for them. And laundry was just one of the examples of this. There's other examples um, in farming. Um, there's instances where Lawrence Tolliver is trying to get a farming uh, community set up over by what's now like Harriet, the chain of lakes. And he's really frustrated because the Dakota people don't want to farm. They don't want to use the plow. Um, and one of the chiefs, Chief Cloudman, comes back and, I, and says to Lawrence Tolliver, like, all of the people who we interact with, who are like the elite settlers, like Henry Sibley, none of them are actually farming their own land. They all have slaves or um, servants to do it for them. So we're like, we're not gonna do that. We, we would expect that somebody else would cultivate our land for us uh, based on the example that you've set. So um, it just like, yeah, marks this really kind of sharp contradiction um in in that in that history yeah i i mean i find that you're providing an insight into the production of whiteness that i hadn't fully thought through before and i really appreciate that and it, it's a lot you're giving us a lot to think about um robin do you want to read some a question out of the chat Yes, we're getting some wonderful questions. Great, great. Um, M had a question um, for you, Jane. Is the study of enslaved people in territories that eventually became the US a large area of academic study? And perhaps M, that was um, non-slave states you're referring here? Um, yeah, I, if it is non-slave, States, thanks, Em, for that question, and thanks for coming. Uh, it's typically, um, from what I've seen, um, largely incorporated into histories of the American West. So this idea um, is kind of still really resonant that because a place was deemed a free soil, territory or state that there wouldn't, that the practice of slavery wouldn't have a foothold there. Um, and that historically is not true, though there are also instances of emancipated or um, otherwise free African-Americans in these kinds of West, Western, Western 
um, states, but I'd say the majority of the place that I've seen that happen is in the histories of the American West. So like a history of California that talks about the debates around whether California would be a slave state or a free state um, and what that meant for like the, the kind of, um, the kinds of people who then ended up moving to California was whether or not they could bring a slave or, or not. Um, so I don't know if that exactly, it, I wouldn't say it's large in that sense, mostly because there's a lot also to be done about slavery in the plant in the plantation south, like where slavery was really, really widely practiced and where um, some of the largest like, profits were to be made. But I think it's growing now to look at the ways that slavery um, impacted other regions of the United States and the Americas as a whole. Great. Um, let's see, Carol had a question. Were there um, indigenous people who were also laborers free or held as involuntary laborers at, I'm assuming that would be at Fort Snelling? Yes and no. Um, And I say yes, because there were people who were held involuntarily, Dakota people who were held involuntarily at Fort Snelling. Um, Fort Snelling was used as a concentration camp site during the US Dakota War for Dakota women and children. Um, though I'm not certain about the historic record as if, if they were like meant to be laboring or were just imprisoned there and, and not working. That part I'm not so clear on. Um, the other, I'll have to look into that a little bit more. I'm, I'm unclear about the, some of the status, statuses of um, like Dakota people, but I, I do know that um, Maddie Harper, a historian at um, the Minnesota Historical Society, also did her degree at Berkeley, um, has a wonderful dissertation that's publicly available about the relationships between um, mixed race, uh, Dakota people, the history of both indigenous slavery um, and like indigenous slavery as in the ways in which different um, nations enslaved other nations and the, the slaveholding practices of certain tribes in addition to how that relates um, to free black fur traders at the time. Um, I have the, let me see what it, it's right here, I have it. Um, yeah, Maddie Harper, French Africans in Ojibwe country and her dissertation is available online. Wonderful. We'll try to get a link to that. If, mm -hmm. if, if Clarence, if you can, <laughs> you're so good at doing this. He is good um, at it. Yeah. He's so good at it. Um, so related to that, um, um, there was a question about, oh yes, here it is. What were some other roles that enslaved people played at the fort? Was that part of your research, Jane? Do you have some, I mean, I know there were probably quite a few different things. Yeah, so um, I mostly know about Dred Scott, um, Harriet's husband. Uh, he was enslaved and brought to Fort Snelling by military doctor, um, Dr. Emerson. So a lot of his work was actually supporting the doctor. And there seems to be some historic evidence that he administered vaccines, Dred Scott did, administered vaccines, um, as well as helped with, at the time, certain medical procedures like bloodletting and leaching. Um, so he also, so, I mean, for all intents and purposes, the enslaved also um, did labor to help settlers survive through the medical side as well. Um, since he, his owner was the fort doctor. And I recently learned that while um, 
Harriet and Scott, Dred, Her, Harriet and Dred Scott, when they lived in St. Louis, when there was a um, cholera outbreak, because Dred had previous medical training, he was um, kind of hired out by the Emersons who owned him at the time to the medical doctors to administer um, vaccines and to tend to the sick during this, this outbreak. So that's one example. Um, there are others I know um, doing some of the agricultural work, gardening um, to supplement the, the rations that the US military gave to the officers um, is one, one thing. And then also um, oftentimes running different errands between some of the individual settlement sites um, was also a task that, that the enslaved would do. Do you have any information, Jane, on um, Harriet and Dred's life together, like how they met, if they had children here when they were here, or um, anything else you want to share about their lives? Yes, I can certainly do that. And thanks for bringing that question up. I didn't really have the space to totally get into it here, but um, Dred and Harriet Scott met while they were at Fort Snelling. Um, Harriet arrived in 1835. I believe Dred Scott arrived in 1836 um, with, with the doctor who I mentioned. And um, they were married by Lawrence Tolliver, Harriet's owner, who, and this is part of the legal case, is it's unclear if then her status was tied to dreads as an enslaved um, person, or if by marrying her, um, Lawrence Tolliver was was giving, or by performing the marriage ceremony, Lawrence Tolliver was ostensibly emancipating Harriet. So that's a little fuzzy in the historic record. But yes, and then they ended up having two children, um, though none, I don't believe, I believe their first child was born on a steamboat leaving um, Fort Snelling to St. Louis and their second child was born in St. Louis, I believe. Um, and what's really interesting about um, Harriet as a mother is this is one of the reasons that, that some historians think it was maybe Harriet's idea to sue for freedom because while you were in a freedom suit, you could not be sold. Your status couldn't change. Um, and it was typical that once young enslaved women reached about the age of eight, they were available to be sold um, to pay master's debts or things like that, which would have broken up the family that had been together up until this point. So um, it's at their first daughter's eighth birthday that year that they first file for their freedom um, they never tried before then. So, so yeah, some people have, have said that that is determined that Harriet was kind of really the one in order to try to keep her family together and, and not let them be separated um, was why she encouraged Dredd to go forward with the lawsuit. Of course, this is all speculation because we don't have her words, but... Um, it's interesting to think that that could be a possibility. We have some questions. I'm trying to relate these questions, which are fantastic questions, talking about your methodology. Jane, um, first question was about, let's see if I can clump these a little bit. Um, how, how did you work through studying your own home area with the challenges um, of the intimacy and the understanding that you have here? And then um, if you wanted to talk a little bit about um, while you were doing that, how it felt, and then working with such what you said was a limited archive, um, what kind of 
maybe personal, I mean, share what you feel comfortable sharing, but personal emotions or, or thoughts or new ideas popped up for you? I mean, those are really big questions. I could probably spend an hour on that, but. I know. <laughs> yes. Um, no, those are great. And thanks for the synthesis. I think you did a great job with that. They are really interrelated. So um, I, in, in researching a place that I grew up in, um, my visits to Fort Snelling during my research year during 2021 was not the first time I had been to Fort Snelling. Um, in the third or fourth grade, like a lot of kids who grow up in the Twin Cities, we go to Fort Snelling as a field trip. Um, it's like a two-part field trip where we spent half of the day looking for fossils down in these river in this river valley. Um, and I got to take one home. <laughs> My mom's still on the call. I'm like, mom, do you know where that is? But, um, uh, and then you go to Fort Snelling and watch the reenactments. Um, they had like blacksmiths there and people dressed up and marching and, and doing the kinds of historical reenactment at the fort. Um, and I'm not sure if it's because I was in fourth grade or if things had changed at Fort Snelling in the ways that the history is told, but I never learned about Harriet or Dred Scott until I came back for my research, um, which I is quite shocking given that they are probably the most famous people to come through the fort in terms of the broader American history. So going back there this time, was definitely about a, a reflecting on what I remember learning or the experiences I remember having as a child and the present day and the knowledge that I have about these kinds of layered, um, layered uh, histories and layered violence that happened at Fort Snelling. I mean, it's a military base. So there, that was, you know, active in, the US Dakota War. So uh, to me, I think that distinction was very different. Like ex experiencing Fort Snelling as a child where all I wanted to do was like get a bonnet and be like uh, Laura Ingalls Wilder. And then coming to the realization as an adult that like the only role that I would be playing is probably of an enslaved person at Fort Snelling um, was like, yeah, quite shocking. Also on an even more personal note, um, I go to Fort Snelling, that area quite often because all of my dad's side of the family is buried at Fort Snelling National Cemetery. Um, my father, my grandfather, my grandma, and my aunt. And so I've had this experience of going and visiting this area, which um, has usually been one of like grief to then also understanding the, all, the layers of grief um, for others at, at this site has been, yeah, really, really powerful uh, in kind of trying to do a little bit of a history of the present. I hope that answered that question um, a bit. Yeah, I think, I think that was a great answer. Um, I wanna thank Carrie and Harvey for sharing the information about Maddie Harper's um, thesis. Yes, thank Thanks you. for putting that in the chat with links. That's great. Um, there was another question if the um, indigenous and the black folks were, were at the fort, do you know if they ever worked together to resist um, the slavery or the labor or their dispossession that was going on? Yeah, this is something that I've been trying to find trying to find moments of in Minnesota's history. And there have been some instances, though again, not really well documented because of some of the limitations of our of archival research, but um, where, for example, uh, 
free black um, workers, uh, laborers, like around this time period, around um, when Minnesota becomes a state and the US Dakota war are um, fighting on behalf of the Dakota people. There's also instances of um, African-Americans not doing that. So it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated history. Um, I think I've seen it, these forms of like solidarities more clearly in uh, the more recent past, such as uh, the relationship between the American Indian movement and a lot of black organizing on the north side of Minneapolis in the late 60s, which I also have a, as a shameless plug, a chapter of my dissertation on. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's a place that I need to do a little bit more research. Um, I think I have one book off the top of my head right now, which I'll find and put in the chat that I think addresses this, but um, yeah. And there was a question too about um, the impact of the river and the river boats, which were so essential to St. Paul, Fort Snelling and Minneapolis. And of course the militarism at the fort, um, how did that impact? Did you do any research on how that might've impacted the daily life of the enslaved people here in Minnesota? Um, and the, the comment, the questioner commented that Harriet's use of riverboat excess fat for soap was fascinating. So thank you for sharing that tidbit. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, so the whole kind of, kind of inspiration for how I've come to understand this history actually stems from the relationship between, uh, the people who lived at Fort Snelling and the river, because the river, Mississippi specifically, provided almost all of the, the goods, food, um, resources, such as like uh, things like paper, um, ink for um, signing, things like treaties and two other things like uh, grains, food, foodstuffs, all of that had to be shipped up the steamboat um, to Fort Snelling. So in the winter time, when the river was frozen, you could not leave. So anybody who wanted to not wet, spend the winter in Minnesota or in, the, in what then it was called the Wisconsin territory, had to leave before the river froze. So winters were also very isolating because there was not many people um, except for the enslaved people who had to stay it should um, their master be spending the winter. So Lawrence Tolliver would often spend the winters which meant that Harriet had to stay, um, stay through the winter. So. I think that was sort of related to the question about the, the steamboats, the river boats relate, uh, related specifically to Harriet. So her whole kind of daily schedule changed the second the river changed. Um, she couldn't do the kinds of, you know, she had seasonal labor based on what kind of resources could come to the fort. Um, and then related to the river more broadly, and, and uh, Peter, you could probably talk about this too, but there's also histories of, you know, the Mississippi River being instrumental in um, bringing um, fugitive slaves to free soil. And there's a handful of histories of steamboats and riverboats tugging rafts of enslaved people free, fleeing the South um, and Missouri especially um, to come up the river. And then also not being welcomed or met happily, they were often welcomed yeah. by mobs um, and forced to 
for their own safety actually go to Fort Snelling, which was the only place that could protect them from the kinds of like settler mobs on, on the southern part of the river. So um, the river certainly plays a large, large role in both the types of labor that the enslaved performed, the kinds of goods that were available in terms of like livability. So things like candles, I mean, you just wouldn't have light if you used all of your, all of your candles. Um, so it had a huge, huge impact in this early Minnesota history. And an even huger impact if you think about the history before settlement um, as this convergence site for the Dakota people um, and as a sacred site, then that's history is much longer than, yeah. than the history that, that I'm kind of talking about. That's true. Thank you for mentioning that, Jane. We appreciate that. Um, Bailey, um, in a minute, if we want to stop the recording, we will let people chat. But first of all, I want to give a big shout out to Jane for your great presentation and wish you all the best on getting your thesis through committee. And um, again, thank you to Peter and um, everybody at the East Side Freedom Library and the Roseville Library. And so Peter, if you want to have a few wrap up words, we'll turn off the recording in just a minute and then we can share things off the record. Yeah, I, this has just been great. It's so suggestive um, of bigger questions and ways of looking at history. I, I so appreciate it, Jane. And, um, and I appreciate that I think you not only cohered the largest audience that we've ever had, but also the most geographically diverse audience that we've ever had. And in this world of Zoom, it's, it's great to feel this connection that, that people would take time out of their lives to think about this history and these questions. Um, it's one of those great things that's going on today under the radar. Our mass media doesn't tell us that people think about these questions today and converse with each other about them. And it's great. Th thank you so much.